When you think of cutting edge technology at sea, you might be thinking of stuff like this. But there's an incoming revolution on the high seas that isn't quite as sexy, but could be significantly more impactful. Container shipping is the key component of global trade. About 80 or 90% of all the world's goods are transported at sea at some point. And these ships carry trillions of dollars of goods on them, and without them there would be no globalization. But there's a significant unseen cost to the modern era of global commerce. About 3% of all the world's CO2 emissions come from shipping. 3% may not sound like a lot, but that's roughly comparable to the entire CO2 output of Germany. Or, in other words, around the same amount of emissions from all forms of aviation combined. Since reducing trade isn't a likely option, what about a technological improvement to help reduce the emissions from these well-stocked maritime behemoths? Transport by sea has always been the most cost-efficient method of moving. I mean, it was like that in, in the Stone Age, and it's still like that today. In the more recent history, it was in the 1970s that the big breakthrough came when the use of standard-sized containers became the norm. That's really what revolutionized trade and made globalization as we know it today possible. Today, we are used to buying things in Europe and the US that's made in China. 50 years ago, that was not the norm. That's the container that made that possible. Only about six or 7,000 container ships handle this big conveyor belt of goods. They have doubled in size many times over during the last couple of decades. And now the biggest container ships there are can carry more than 20,000 containers and they're longer than 400 meters. So why not electrify a fleet of cargo ships? and take advantage of the emissions cuts that come with it. Well, some are trying. Take Yara, a fertilizer company in Norway, and their electric autonomous ship, the Brookland. And we can start by addressing the question, why is a fertilizer company building ships at all? We uh, have a lot of focus of making sustainable products, producing uh, food for the whole population in a sustainable way is one of the important tasks that we as a company see. And transportation and the supply chain is also part of the environmental load that we put on the society. The Birkland, it's unique because it is electric and then also emission free. And it's going to be autonomous without any ship crew on board. We are exporting about 20,000 containers a year. So that will then eliminate 40,000 truck drives through the town of Porskeden. The Brookland isn't going to be any cheaper to operate than a traditional vessel, at least for now. But according to Yara, that's not its purpose. It is more the effect on the environment, reducing CO2 emission. And also an important factor, this ship has got a lot of attention. And it's been a kind of a catalyst for the others also to develop green maritime transport. But the Auerberg land has a significant limitation, range. A similarly sized vessel with a diesel engine can travel up to 5,000 nautical miles. The Auerberg land, around 80. They will use it for a very specific route in, in Norway between two sites fairly close to each other. The ship can carry about uh, 120 containers, and you would need about 200 of these small ships to match one of the very large container vessels that's out there. So the Yara Brookland has a solid but niche potential application. For longer range ships, the technology faces the same issues that were common to early road going EVs. If you look at a Tesla, Tesla has a battery that weighs 1,200 pounds. If you should fit a battery into a container ship that's uh, 400 meters long, it would just be massive. Because of these limitations, the industry's heavy hitters are turning elsewhere for carbon cutting. Maersk, the world's largest shipping company by vessels owned, currently consumes around 12 million tons of oil per year, which is about what the entire world produces every day. 
In order to reach its goal of being carbon neutral by 2040, the company is looking to change up what's in the tank. The power requirements are just too high for battery technology at the moment. You're talking about ships with an engine on with a, more than 100,000 horsepower. In the marine industry, the only real way to reduce emissions is to actually change the fuel. To begin that change, Maersk turned to MAN Solutions. MAN Solutions is part of the Volkswagen Group. I'm the oldest industrial company in Germany, founded in 1758. We're a little bit different to the car industry because we operate in uh, the marine industry. With AP Muller Maersk, we'll receive an order for 12 methanol fuel ships. So the idea is to have a carbon neutral ship, completely carbon neutral. Methanol is quite an interesting fuel because, of course, it's very CO2 neutral. The second thing is it liquefies at ambient temperature, so actually it's relatively simple to store and use. The genius thing about the engines that we produce is because of our modular design, we can actually modify the engines fairly simply to run on different fuels. And actually a lot of our engines are supplied in a dual fuel mold, so they can run on one fuel today and a different fuel tomorrow. There's many types of new fuels that will allow us to decarbonize the industry, but of course what we need is a kind of transition and you can go to liquid natural gas or even synthetic natural gas which give us good reductions in CO2. We intend to have a vessel operating in 2024 on ammonia, which of course is the absolute game changer in terms of emissions. Some of these alternative fuels, however, have drawbacks. We're looking at ammonia, which is a highly toxic chemical, but it's also CO2 neutral. Obviously the disadvantage is that it's very dangerous both for humans and marine life. Liquefied natural gas, some shipping lines are looking at that. The problem with that is obviously that it's not CO2 neutral, it just reduces the CO2 emissions from the ships. But another solution is methanol, which is sourced from green electricity. Methanol is readily available today and really is carbon neutral. Of all the technologies, I think methanol is for sure the, the short or medium term future. There's an infrastructure around methanol. I think methanol at the moment seems to be more available and of course the technology is proven. Although switching to alternative fuels is expected to add 10 to 12 percent to shipping costs, this could be the perfect time for shipping companies to add in a buffer for that premium. In the last two years, the industry has been in great shape. And the reason why they're in great shape is, well, many are aware that the world suffers from supply chain issues, but it's actually an advantage for the companies that owns the ships because they can charge higher prices at the moment. So there's a lot of cash flow in the container shipping industry right now, and that should enable the companies and the ship owners to invest in new technologies that reduce global emissions. While these mammoth vessels make incremental progress in decarbonizing, smaller ships are more readily adopting new technologies. Take Promari's Mayflower vessel. Using hybrid solar, wind, and diesel propulsion, it's equipped to travel autonomously, with no crew, to conduct research on marine health. It's designed to cruise around the oceans and collect scientific data, so climate data, water quality data, data about marine mammals, and bring back samples and also transmit samples off the boat into the, uh, into the ether for consumption by the scientific community. According to Promare, the advantages of the Mayflower being unmanned and AI-driven will be both in its increased efficiency and its ability to go where most ships never do. One of the things to bear in mind with these vessels is once you remove all the people stuff, they become extremely efficient in the sense that the power it takes to move this vessel over long distances is absurdly low by comparison to a vessel the same size carrying people on it. It's very, very green because it just sips on the fuel. But it's an electric, uh, dual electric motors that are driven by lithium iron phosphate battery system, similar to what you'd find in the Tesla. And then there are solar panels that charge emergency batteries and then also charge the main batteries so that if we lose main propulsion for some reason, the solar power and battery systems that are adjacent to the primary batteries will keep the navigation lights and communications and position data live. Then the main batteries that drive the engines and run all the sophisticated systems are periodically charged by a biodiesel generator. 
So we can use biofuel or we can use straight diesel, whichever we prefer. It doesn't replace ships with people on it, but it sort of democratized the ability to collect data and produce information that we can all share so that when we do send a very expensive ship with people on it out for very long voyages into the middle of nowhere, that those people are best spending their time on the areas that will produce the most results in terms of answering the big questions that boats like this help to ask. The dream would be to have many, many, many ships like this. So if you look at where we get our data about the ocean, it's almost completely biased to the commercial shipping channels, right? They're going, ships going back and forth on major trading routes. Ships like Mayflower and many others like it, both very small ones, even larger ones, are what we need to kind of reduce the cost of collecting that fundamental data and producing that sort of first tier of information. Promare plans to send the Mayflower on its first transatlantic voyage in April. Across the pond in Alameda, California, another company is looking to commit swarms of electric autonomous drones to the seas. That company is SailDrone. The first vehicles were designed to be data gathering robots that really gather atmospheric and oceanographic data, which is kind of the critical piece of the puzzle we need to understand climate change and the rate of change. So we started gathering data on fish stocks, on the water column itself. That led us to ocean mapping, so mapping the seabed. What we excel at with the robot is kind of the long, monotonous or dangerous things that you know, people shouldn't be doing. So persistent present operations in the high Arctic, um, Southern Ocean where it's just too rough to go with the human. Hurricane exploration is a great example. The boats are electric vehicles, so they run on battery power. It is wind powered for propulsion and solar powered for the electricity for the computers and so on. Electrification of you know, marine systems is key, but I'll go further than that saying it's not just electrification, it's harnessing renewable sources of, so wind and solar, to power those vehicles along. The real challenge for any maritime vessel is having enough power on board to propel you. So if you don't harvest power along the way, you have to carry that as stored power, either a huge amount of batteries or an alternative fuel source, diesel, hydrogen or other. So for us, we try and maximize the utility of renewable sources, and obviously that's wind. Sending ships are kind of one of the oldest technologies on the planet and a true, reliable and sustainable form of power. So we utilize that a lot, and that reduces the amount of fuel you have to take, and it reduces the amount of mechanical load on the vehicles. Less time you can run an engine for, the longer that's gonna last. But there are areas of the world where you don't have a lot of sunlight. The Northern Hemisphere in the winter, up in the Arctic, obviously a lot of it's frozen, but in the unfrozen area where, where we operate, um, you have very, very low light levels, very short days, very short summers and that means we struggle for power in the winter months. Right now we're using high efficiency small diesel engines that run at kind of a very efficient RPM uh, to charge batteries in a very short period of time. So like a diesel electric system on a ship, we use engines to charge batteries and then you run the ship off batteries. Having backup combustion engines proves just how hard it will be for ocean going vessels to completely ditch carbon emitting fuels. Regardless, stakeholders in the industry seem to agree that progress must continue and fast. If we can decarbonize this industry, and we need to act very, very quickly because it's not just about the new ships, it's about the existing ships, then we can have a dramatic impact to make sure we hit the targets that have been set out. We needed to act yesterday, not tomorrow. We needed to act yesterday. So the quicker we can get this moving, then the better for everybody.